Hey guys, Pastor Ben here with another review and reflection. Today I want to talk about The Horse and His Boy. This is book five in the Chronicles of Narnia written by C.S. Lewis. Uh, if you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll know I've been reading through this series with my girls. And we finished reading this book um, probably a month or more ago. I'm very behind on book reviews. Uh, so um, I've got a kind of backlog of videos to record, and we've actually not only finished this book now, we've also finished the next book in the series, and we're reading the last book of the series currently. So I'm going to try to record some videos here in the next week or so so that I can kind of get caught up a little bit. But I really, really enjoyed reading this book with my girls um, because this was always one of my favorite of the Narnia series as a boy. And revisiting it now with my own kids... Um, I enjoyed it just as much as I ever did. So uh, as I've typically been doing with my reviews of the Narnia books, I'm going to assume that you've either read the book or don't mind spoilers. So if you're someone who just doesn't want to know the plot and how things unfold, maybe don't watch this video. But um, this is a really interesting book for a couple of reasons in, in terms of how it fits into the Narnia series. Uh, for one thing, um, it is uh, one of the books that takes place largely outside of Narnia. Um, there's really only like a scene or two that actually takes place in the land of Narnia. Most of it takes place in a country to the south of Narnia called Kalorman. And uh, the rest of the scenes take place in another country next to Narnia called Arkenland, which gets mentioned in a few of the other books but doesn't really feature prominently. So it's interesting to have a Narnia book that mostly doesn't happen in Narnia. Although, as we'll, I'll talk about, there are, you know, overlaps and connections there. Um, however, it, that gives it a really interesting flavor because um, at this point, you know, in reading the book um, or reading through the series, you know, readers will already have become familiar with the world of Narnia and the characters of Narnia. And so this is taking place and it's following a, a young boy named Shasta, who is actually from these kind of northern countries, Narnia and Arkenland. Uh, but he uh, was abandoned and ends up being adopted by a fisherman in this country of Kalorman, which is kind of culturally a mashup of sort of Arab and Indian cultures, sort of uh, this, you know, um, exotic Eastern, Middle Eastern kind of cultural uh, amalgamation that, that uh, Lewis imagines. And um, he ends up being raised by this fisherman and um, finds out that the fisherman is going to sell him to become a slave uh, to a passing Tarkhan, which is sort of their equivalent of a sort of noble or knight. And um, as Shasta, this boy, is overhearing uh, the fisherman who kind of took him in talking about this, he goes to feed the um, Tarkhan's horse, who turns out to be a tar talking horse from Narnia. And he's been keeping his identity secret. He's been living in Kalorman. But like Shasta, he's from the north, has ended up in the south and wants to make his way back again. And so that kind of sets off uh, the journey and gives it the title as well, The Horse and His Boy. So it's following Shasta and Bree, Bree is the name of the horse, as they make their way north uh, back into uh, Narnia. But along the way, they're going to meet with uh, another uh, cast of characters, another talking horse, Hwen, and uh, a girl who is uh, a Kalorman, uh, a Tarkina, so she's a kind of aristocratic uh, girl, who has found out that she's going to be married off to this older guy that she's not interested in. And um, she finds out that this horse that is uh, belongs to her family is actually a talking horse from Narnia. She tells her about that and they say, okay, let's head off north. And they end up getting pushed together. So they travel together up to Narnia and Arkenland. Along the way, what ends up happening then is that they find out that there's a broader plot going on against both Arkenland and Narnia, and so they end up in this kind of race across the desert to try and get there before these Kalorman armies go over to invade uh, these countries. And so that kind of, you know, moves moves the story along. And I won't go through all of the ins and outs of how the plot resolves, but that's the kind of broad sweep of things. So again, you may be wondering at this point, like, so, so what does Narnia have to do with this series uh, if, if they don't really show up in those countries until the very end of the story? And, and the main overlap is this. Um, the uh, this is a book that takes place during the reign of uh, the four Pevensey children. So you know Peter, Susan, Lucy, and Edmund. We see them come into Narnia in uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and we read. There's this interesting you know thing at the at the end of that book where 
they become the kings and queens, and it says they reigned for years and years and years, and it was this golden age in Narnia, and then we see them as adults find their way back to the wardrobe, and they re-enter the world and their children again, and, and that's kind of all we know about their reign. And so you're left wondering, as you're reading the series, like, what was going on? What was life like when those four characters were actually kings and queens in Narnia? Well, this book is taking place during that time period. In fact, we get to see not all four of the Pevensey children, but we get to meet um, Edmund and, and Susan um, in, uh, in this story as adults, because they're actually visiting Tashban, the capital of Kalorman, because uh, Queen Susan is being courted by the uh, Prince Rabidash, who's sort of the next in line to become um, the head of Kalorman. And uh, as they're there, they find out that his entreaties are, are disingenuous. He's not an honorable man. And so they end up having to kind of contrive an escape. And that's what sets off this threat, this attack against Arkenland and Narnia uh, by, by the Kalormans. And so, so it's an interesting kind of uh, connection point where you get to sort of see a window into the reign of these kings and queens that uh, you've maybe wondered about. But the main uh, connection point, of course, is Aslan himself, because... Aslan ends up appearing, um, I'm, I'm curious to kind of think about, you know, which of the stories we get to see the most of Aslan in, but Aslan appears in this story a lot. However, we don't meet him. He, he doesn't talk, as it were, until more at the end of the story. And what's interesting is there's some fascinating encounters between Shasta, the main character, and Aslan later on in the story. Um, where Shasta, who has had a hard life and has had a lot of things go wrong in his life, is just feeling sorry for himself, and he's traveling up to Arkenland, he's trying to beat the armies that are trying to invade, and he's all on his own now. The rest of, the, of his companions are kind of back behind somewhere, and he's bemoaning his lot in life, and he finally meets the lion, Aslan. Now, he's met other lions along the way who have been, you know, he's seen them as problems, but as he talks with Aslan, Aslan reveals to him that in every instance, it was actually him that was there. Aslan was the lion that was there, you know, chasing them to give them more speed or protecting him uh, at different points. And, and he didn't even know it. So what you get is this beautiful scene where Shasta, who has grown up uh, with a kind of despairing view of life, he thinks everything has not gone his way. He feels sorry for himself. And Aslan shows him, actually, I have been showing my kindness to you, my presence to you, uh, over and over and over again. You just couldn't see it. You didn't have the eyes to see. And it's this incredible scene that's very powerful every time I read it, um, just reminding us of what's true of our lives as well um, and what's true of history as a whole. There's so many points where people say, you know, all these things have gone wrong. Where was God? Where was God? And uh, and of course, the reality is, you know, God God is the one who has been ordering all of human history and his plans and purposes are so far beyond ours. Isaiah says, you know, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. And we can see examples of that over and over and over again. So even though we can't put our finger on every instance in our life or everything in human history and say, oh, here's what God was doing. We can see so many things where in the moment no one could understand it. And yet later we look back and go, oh, that's what God was doing. And it builds your trust in him. It helps you to see um, God's love and care and provision. And that's what Shasta begins to see. So it's, it's a real wonderful story, not just of, of uh, it capitalizes on that sense of longing for, um, for Narnia in this instance, which is, I think, a picture of Nar longing for heaven, longing for God, and also a kind of uh, unfolding as these different characters who have heard something about Aslan but don't really know him get to know him personally. So you get to sort of see that happen in real life. So it's a fascinating fascinating book from from all of those sort of thematic standpoints it's also just a good adventure tale you know you've got uh, a boy little boy running off traveling across the desert having to sneak around racing against armies you know just a lot of great uh, you know battles and adventures so as a as a child i just loved it i it was great to read it to my kids and then see them immediately begin to play it as they're pretending uh, as i was looking at reviews online i was kind of shocked to find how many people hate this book and the main critique is that they think they they read Tolkien's depiction or sorry Tolkien, they read Lewis's depiction of Kalorman as being a kind of racist colonialist xenophobic uh, bundle of stereotypes. So they say this is just disgusting, you know we shouldn't read it today. Blah 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 blah. 
and um, I, I've got to admit, I have, I have very little sympathy <laughs> for that way of, of thinking. They, they seem, those readers seem to be taking a very kind of racially charged set of categories and superimposing it back on Lewis that doesn't really seem to fit because um, Lewis's understanding of Narnia and Arkenland is not primarily racial, and nor is his depiction of of Kalorman. and um, and he has good and bad characters on both on both sides. So um, it seemed to me like um, an example of where modern sensibilities, modern progressive sensibilities, are distorting people's ability to even understand and appreciate a great kids book, a great adventure story. And uh, what was interesting is I didn't see anyone who actually was from you know, the kind of cultures that he's broadly drawing from, again, Indian and Arabic. I didn't see anyone from those cultures who was offended. I saw a lot of people who were, um, you know, majority white Western um, who were very offended by that. So I, I, I've got to admit, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see the, uh, the, the issues that they're um, rubbing up against. And I think they're missing out on a really wonderful book in a really wonderful series. So um, I would highly uh, recommend, if you haven't already, to read, or if you have read it, take the chance to reread uh, The Horse and His Boy. This is book five in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis.